Hi guys, so this one was directed by S.S. Wilson. It was his directorial debut, and the only film, the only other film he went on to direct after this was Tremors 4. He did do a lot of other movie-related work throughout his career, but these were the only two films he ever directed, so obviously this was a big franchise for him. One thing I've always noticed when I've been discussing all things horror with people on the internet is that there are a lot of folk out there who have seen the original Tremors, really, really liked it, but then not gone on to watch any of the sequels. I just find that really bizarre. I guess the fact that Kevin Bacon didn't come back for number two would be a, a huge influencing factor in that. But we do get Fred Ward, who played Earl Bassett in the first movie. He comes back. We've also got this other excellent returning character in Burt Gummer, played by Michael Gross. So two outstanding characters from Tremors 1 do return. Now, here's the thing about Kevin Bacon. He might be a more famous actor than the likes of Fred Ward. You know, he, he has a certain Hollywood pull that some of these other guys in Tremors don't have. But in the world of Tremors... Kev, uh, Kevin Bacon is Fred Ward's equal for me. You know, the character of Val is not better than the character of Earl. If anything, I might actually prefer Earl to Val. I just think he's funnier. So let me get this out there. You know, the fact that we have Earl and Bert coming back for this makes a massive difference compared to if we'd have just had a sequel with none of the returning actors, none of the returning actors maybe just a random busload of teens breaking down in Nevada and, oh, we've got more worms. So I think there was, there was a good scope for a, a decent sequel with this. The storyline takes place in Mexico rather than Nevada. Now, we never got to find out that much about the origin of the worms in the first film, which is fine. I don't need to know where the boogeyman comes from. In this film, we just get a random outbreak of graboids in Mexico. So we pick up the story with this oil worker trying to escape a graboid and he almost makes it to his van, but then he gets pulled down into the ground. Now, this is the first moment already that told me this was going to be a really good sequel because they put a lot of effort in with this kill. I mean, if this was just going to be a cheap knockoff cash grab, then I would expect to see this worker just pulled down into the ground without you really seeing anything, maybe a puff of smoke, and then we sort of carry on with the movie. But they, they put a lot of practical effort in with the, the robotic, anima, whatever you call it, animatronic graboid thing that they've put in there. And you can see the actor actually inside the graboid's mouth as it comes out of the ground. And it, it looks quite scary, actually. In the first movie, the closest thing we got to this is probably the Chang character, Walter Chang, when he's in the graboid's mouth and it, it, moving from side to side. That was pretty good. But this one at the start of this film looks a hell of a lot better. Now, I've seen Tremors 2 in the past, but I'd totally forgotten that there was a decent amount of practical effects in this. And when I rewatched it the other night and the, the credits come on, bizarrely before the prologue, that there's one line that's written on there that says, uh, CGI in the film done by blah, blah. And I thought to myself, OK, okay we're going to get a lot more digital stuff in this. There's not going to be any practical uh, graboids. But actually, there's loads. There's possibly more in this film than even in the first film. I don't know if that's Maybe because the graboids in this one are, are a lot smaller, for reasons I'll, I'll go into a little bit later. But it's very impressive what they do with this film, given that surely they had a much cheaper budget and it did go straight to video. So we get this death very early on and the oil company decide to hire Earl to travel to Mexico to sort their problem out for them. And, and Bert eventually decides to go along as well. And that is the setup of our movie. It's sort of implied that the reason Val doesn't want to go along is because he's gotten happily married and he, he just doesn't need that shit anymore. Earl, on the other hand, has not very wisely invested his money that he earned from, from the fame after the first movie. He bought an ostrich farm or something and it's all gone a bit wrong. So he desperately needs money. That's why he's managed to be attracted to this new graboid problem. It's it's going a little bit against the characters as, as as we knew them from the first movie because Earl was sort of the slightly more sensible one, Val maybe not so. But at the start of this film, clearly what's happened is the reverse. You know, Val has used his money wisely since the first film. Earl has not, so he's he's required for action once again. For me, this is probably one of the best horror sequels. I've seen, really. I mean, I'll put Dawn of the Dead ahead of this, and doubtless there are some other films as well that would beat this, but this might just make the Premier League of horror sequels. It's surprisingly good. And I think the reason why is that a lot of the things that worked in the original 
carry over to this. So, I mean, the humour, for one. I, I never would have believed that a, a, a Tremor sequel without Kevin Bacon's Val could be as funny as this is. But honestly, it's great. We get all these brand new combinations of characters uh, to exchange quips with each other. So Earl and Bert obviously get much more time together in this film. We get the Earl... Grady combination, uh, Grady being uh, one of the newer characters, Bert and Grady, all these combinations of guys just giving it back and forth to each other, and it's really funny. I mean, this film is, if not quite as funny as the first film, I mean, it's, it's bloody close to it. Also, this film doesn't rest on its laurels when it comes to the action, when it comes to the graboids. It, just, it doesn't just give you more of the same. It very much takes a leaf out of the Aliens copy book from 1986, which, a film which you know, took the... <clears throat> Piss off, fly. <laughs> so like I was building up to, in this film we see more of the Graboid's biology and what it eventually turns into, so it's shown that after a while the traditional vanilla Graboid, if you like, will get sick and explode from the inside and produce what I would call a land Graboid. I'm not sure if there's a, a proper name for it in the film, I can't remember if there is. Now this new creature doesn't operate under the ground, it operates over the ground, which gives the film a very different flavour. You, you still get some of the traditional graboids in the first half of this, but from the second half right to the end, it's all about the new land graboid. But this is good, it just keeps things fresh, it gives the characters a new thing to think about. Also, whereas the, the, the vanilla graboids, I, I've got to stop calling them vanilla graboids, just call them graboids. Whereas the original Graboids, they hunt by detecting sound, these new land Graboids, they hunt by detecting heat signatures, a bit like the Predator. So again, this just gives the characters a brand new problem to solve, because they were getting quite good at hunting the original Graboids in the first movie, certainly by the end of it. Another thing that I like that's carried over from the first film is this sense that in this series, it, characters problem solve rather than just kill the worms with weapons and fancy explosions and dynamite and things. You do get some of that, but the true spirit of Tremors is characters looking around for what they've got, you know, like in the first movie, they would they would use a water coolant to distract the, the, the creatures. They would get like a, a bulldozer thing to help them out, a little doom buggy thing and whatever, they, whatever they've got lying around. And that carries over into this film. So the back end of this, the last half an hour, which takes place mostly in like a little oil field work area with porter cabins and oil drums and things, the characters are they're solving one problem with their brains and then they're ending up in another situation that requires them to use their heads and so on. It's not just running around with guns and stuff. What you see at the beginning with Bert's truck full of the most insane weapons you've ever seen is a little bit of a red herring in that way, but we still also get a few explosions and instances where, you know, guns are used, but they get the balance in this sequel just right. You know, I'd say it's like 75% characters thinking through the situation at hand and maybe just 25% fun time Bert. The characterization is extremely strong in this, and I'm, I'm going beyond just the humour now. So Earl gets to actually meet somebody in this film, which is absolutely terrific. I mean, in the first one, he was constantly pushing Val towards Rhonda, which was a really selfless act, because ultimately it would just mean that he would end up alone, which is how we see him at the start of this film. But in this one, he gets his turn to meet someone special in the form of Kate, played by Helen Shaver. She doesn't quite make the same impact for me as Rhonda from the first film because Rhonda got a lot more involved in the action, whereas Kate in this only really gets involved in the action in, in, in the third act. Now, I'm going into my first little mini criticism of the movie here because at the start of this film we see the inside of Earl's trailer and he's got a picture on the wall of Miss October 1974. That's Kate uh, as her much younger self back when she was in her early 20s. I guess during this movie, she's sort of mid 40s. Now, it's just a really, really unlikely coincidence that Earl, whilst out graboid hunting, would meet the exact same woman who is on his wall. That, that just doesn't really compute for me. I mean, that would be the same as if I had a poster of Carmen Electra and then went to Magaluf and oh there's Carmen Electra 10 yards down the beach from me and then I go and chat her up and she just happens to be single and we get together even if I was as good looking as Fred Ward that's just that those odds are just astronomical that that could happen so not really buying that so whereas 
Earl's uh, love life is on the up. Bert's is on the downward slope in this. We find out that he and Heather have broken up between Tremors 1 and 2. I'm guessing Reba McIntyre either didn't want to come back as Heather or maybe they just couldn't afford her this time. I'm, I'm glad they don't do that thing where throughout the movie Bert is on the phone to Heather, except it, we just see one side of the conversation and it's like, oh yeah, Heather, we're doing great here. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, totally, I'll, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Yeah, okay, che you know, I, I, don't, I don't like it when they do that in movies. I, I think it's better that they just had it so that Bert has broken up with Heather and I think it just adds a little bit of poignancy to this character that he's lost his wife and all he's got left really is his guns and and this new hobby of graboid hunting it's nice that the characters have different motivations you know earl wants to do this thing to earn loads of money get himself back on his feet bert is mainly just doing it because he's he's got nothing else to do there is one of the main characters who's not that strong and that's the newcomer grady I'm surprised at this because you'd think anybody tackling a Tremor sequel would have been very alert to the biggest danger in such a, an endeavour, which is not properly replacing Val. And the simple fact is that this, this character, Grady, is not that strong. But he's not completely terrible. There are times when he is very funny when he's interacting with Earl, but there's other times when he just acts like a childish brat. Now, what I think they should have done is bring back Melvin from the first movie. I think, so when Earl's going from Nevada to Mexico, I think Melvin could have found a reason to tag along somehow as the helper, the assistant, and Earl and Melvin would have been at loggerheads for a while because that's what they were doing to each other in the first movie. But over the course of Tremors 2, Melvin could have gradually earned the respect of Earl and Bert, and by the end of this story, he would have sort of become a man, you know, and it would have been a really cool character arc. It, it, I'm sure they could have got that actor back because he ends up coming back for, for Tremors 3. But we've got Grady instead, but you know what? When the main four characters are together in the final act of this, Bert, Earl, um, Kate and Grady, as a foursome, they're, they're, they're still an absolutely terrific team. I've got one more negative. They're starting to stack up a little bit now, but this is, I swear, the final one. So there's this scene where one of the Graboids, the original type of Graboids, gets hold of Grady and Earl's car, starts pulling the car really fast across the desert. And this should have been a really high-tension scene, but it's a little bit spoiled by all this, like, cowboyish rodeo-type banjo music that's playing over the top of it. And... It just completely kills all the tension in the scene. That would have been a really scary thing to have been pulled along like that at such a fast speed and going quite close to a cliff as well. But the music just, just takes you out of that scene a little bit. But on the whole, they, they get most of the tone of this film right. That's just one scene where they didn't. But overall, I absolutely still really, really love this film. Time to show you the version of the film that I've got. Here is my Blu-ray copy of Tremors 2. Very, very clear picture. Not quite as good as the 4K of the original, but still very, very clear. This is everything I would want from a film like this. There's no features on this, sadly. It would have been nice to have some documentaries, commentaries, things like that, but I guess that there's probably just not the demand for it. But still, on the whole, a uh, very, very good copy of the film. Right, let's get to the Bag of Terror and find out what sort of score I'm going to give this movie. So we've got one, two, three, four bloody axes out of five. And to be honest, I almost gave it four and a half. It was very, very close. But four out of five is the score. The first film got five out of five for me. That film is a masterpiece. And this is an excellent sequel. I mean, if any horror sequel can get this sort of score, then I'd say they've done a very, very good job of following up the first film. Right, I'll be back soon with a review for Tremors 3. Until next time, cheerio, bye-bye.